Hello and welcome to Wrestling With Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multi-family real estate investor, Barry Griffiths. Now today we're joined by Savannah Arroyo. Hey, Savannah. Hi, how are you? I am doing awesome. I'm doing awesome. I'm very happy to have you on the show and I'm glad that you were able to make the time. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm grateful to be here. Well, where are you for, for people to get some context and understand why the, it's sunny through those blinds right now? Yes, I am in Los Angeles, California. So still getting some daylight over here right now. How, how, is, uh, how is things over there right now with everything? Are you guys locking down again or, or is it we just we're at December 8th? For anyone who's yep, um, we just got a mass text through the emergency mm -hmm. alert on our phone a couple hours ago saying to be cautious, stay inside, only essential travel, wear your mask. Um, so I think they're kind of getting ready for another surge. Mm. Are, are the are bars and restaurants open? Are shops open? Or what, what's kind of the situation like that? So I think um, Newsom sent out something to start closing them. I know that I have seen some people still doing the outdoor dining, but I've also seen people transition to the takeout only as well. So kind of reverting back to that. I've seen kind of a combo of things. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Fortunately, it seems like that's how the, the whole country is kind of going a little bit backwards right now with the whole thing. That's okay. Yep, yep. And take a step in the right direction. Cool. Well, before we jump into the conversation, uh, which is going to be a fun one, um, do you want to give us an idea about your background, what you've been up to, and kind of what you're up to these days? Yeah, so um, my background's in nursing. I uh, graduated from Sacramento State University with my nursing degree uh, up in Sacramento, worked in a couple different departments, a couple different specialties, moved down to Los Angeles, went back to school and got my master's degree in nursing and leadership and administration. Right now, I oversee multiple departments in a hospital here in Los Angeles. Uh, so that's kind of what I do full time. Uh, in real estate, I got started in single family homes and then quickly switched over to multifamily, specifically syndications. Um, so looking primarily at value add multifamily deals. Awesome. Awesome. Well, first and foremost, thank you for being a nurse and serving all the people. Right? We always thank our military people but you know nurses are just equally and doctors are just equally as important so thank you so much for everything that you've done and all everyone that you've served that's amazing what, what you guys do i think um what made you want to get into nursing you think initially um i had an experience in high school where i had to visit a really really sick friend in the hospital and honestly it really scared me um but I think that there was something about looking at every, everyone working within a hospital setting that really appealed to me. And um, just after doing more research in terms of what nurses do on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of all the different avenues you could take as a nurse, um, I realized it was definitely something I wanted to do. And even now that I've been in it and changing multiple specialties and just kind of navigating my myself and my career throughout the healthcare world it's it's an amazing career to be in i love it so much oh good um, that, that's awesome i love when people love what they do that's so cool to me um you said initially um you were doing night shifts right is that what you, you how, how yeah. rough is that do, do, <laughs> does that take some getting used to or are you are you just one of those people that are able to kind of do it and it doesn't affect you so much so it's a constant jet lag. That's kind of your, what you're functioning as like a jet lag level. Um, but with some good earplugs, a good face mask and some uh, blackout curtains. You, and if you can get some good sleep in between shifts, you can make it work. So I did that when I first started. It's kind of like your initiation as a brand new nurse. You kind of get thrown out into night shift. So it was kind of expected, but I gladly gave that up when I had my first daughter. Once I got pregnant, I was like, yeah, I can't be doing this anymore. Uh, oh, um, how old is your daughter? I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. My one-year-old just turned one this Sunday. So uh, I have two little girls at home. Uh, what are their names? Eliana and Isabel. Okay. And it, Isabel's, it was Isabel's birthday or Eliana's? Isabel's birthday. Oh, happy birthday, uh, Isabel. <laughs> Not that you'll ever listen to this. Maybe when she's older, right? Hopefully she'll, she'll sure. go back and listen. Like my mom was so cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So where, um, where in all this did real estate come in? Or at what point and how? So it was actually when I was on maternity leave with my youngest. Um, on maternity leave, just watching some YouTube videos on investing and learning about different things that 
we could do to put ourselves, my husband and I, in a position to kind of have more time freedom. Um, just looking into an investing real estate was huge. I got stuck on a bunch of different YouTube channels, bigger pockets, uh, listened to all the different strategies and niches within real estate. So I, I discovered the burn method, which is, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but you buy a place, rehab it, rent it out, um, refinance. So pull all that money back out and repeat and do it over and over. And this concept to me was so mind blowing. I was like, can't believe you could do this and then make your money continually work with you and just kind of build this empire of real estate. So, um, initially we wanted to get started in that. Um, but being here in Los Angeles and trying to oversee a renovation across the country because we were investing in Georgia at the time, it really just didn't, it wasn't the avenue we wanted to go down. So we ended up by um, gearing more towards buying new, new builds in the single family realm and then um, switched over to multifamily. Yeah, the, the, the Burr method is such a, a crazy, crazy thing when you kind of find out about it, right? Because initially when you hear about real estate investing, you, you buy from the MLS, you use an agent, you put 20% down, you know, that's kind of how it works, right? So I think most people, right, who understand anything or who think they understand anything about wrestling, then you get exposed to, like you said, all the stuff on YouTube, especially bigger pockets and all this stuff. And you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you have all this different world like, that's out there that you have access to. It's just crazy, right? I don't know if yeah, you know I mean that. It was like my my head exploded when I realized that, I think. Yes, people house hacking, people doing the short-term rentals and making so much money before COVID through the Airbnb and that sort of thing. People buying land, um, hotels, like mobile home parks. It's crazy, all the different strategies out there. Yeah, and I'm happy you, you explained the burn, I mean, because I always get the R's wrong. Eh? <laughs> I can never remember what they all are. I try and explain every time, and I always forget but that's i love that model myself not i had, i don't have any experience in it but i love the idea of essentially what you do is you buy a property for cheap you fix it up and because you you've created that equity that you're able to yeah. take out hopefully all or, or, or most of your money so that you have that money to roll over into the next deal and you, you're left over with equity and some cash flow and you could just keep doing that over and over and i know a lot of, i spoke to someone just be, before this that had a uh, 110 properties and that was the main method that they wow. used. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. But they, oh, but he, he was in uh, New Jersey and he was able to do that. So he was like, wh he was where they were at. So, but, um, so, so talk about the, the maybe the, those first properties that you tried doing the burn method is I'm guessing it didn't go as planned with those. What, what kind of happened with those? So we, we looked for a broker over in Georgia because we were really set on that market for a lot of different reasons, but um, just price point to entry compared to LA, it just was a lot easier for us. We knew people over there. Um, it's a really hot market right now. So we were looking over there, cheap properties. I mean, you can buy a fixer upper for less than a hundred thousand and get in around like maybe 60 would be like low point over there in an up and coming neighborhood, which there's a lot of them over there. And um, just talking to brokers and then realizing like the inspection period and really being able to trust people to quote us on what the rehab and renovation would be and then finding contractors. We just really needed to have a great team over there to make that happen. And although I don't doubt we could have built it, it just, the more we looked into what it would take to make something like that get done, we just were like, mm, that's, that strategy is not for us. And we kind of backed out of that one and went towards buying new builds over there. So that um, just no maintenance, really super easy to get started in and then switched over to multifamily. That's awesome. I, I, I appreciate that a lot. Like it's easy to to, to hear all these strategies and go like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Right. I'm yeah. going to flip. I'm going to do this. But at the end of the day, you've got to realize what your comfort level is. Right. And you've also got to set yourself up for success. You know, right. there's a bunch of different strategies like we talked about earlier, but if you can find one that suits you and your lifestyle, right. It's not always about what bigger pockets are telling. I'm not knocking bigger pockets for a second. It's amazing, but you've got to find what's going to work for you. And you guys realize that that time, right. This is the other side of the country. Um, we don't feel comfortable doing the renovation, finding the deals, doing all that work, right? It didn't suit your, what you guys were, where you guys were at, right? And it's also important when you're starting out, I think that you don't need home runs to start off with, right? You guys went for new builds and something that obviously with a new build, I'm guessing that never bought one, but you, you know, the, there's a lot less risk factor, right? You probably right. have a two or three year warranty, everything's brand new. You don't have to worry about major CapEx items, all that stuff, right? Is that, is that kind of why you guys went, went down that route? 
Yeah. So personally, our home in LA was a new build. So we just have experience moving in a house brand new. I mean, we've had no maintenance on this house whatsoever. I mean, we upgraded the floors just because we wanted to. And our home here in Los Angeles, within the three years of owning it, had already appreciated over $100,000. So we kind of used it as a bank and took out a second mortgage and tapped into that money. So we were kind of thinking like, I mean, a lot of people say, it's all about how you buy a property and buying a new build wouldn't necessarily be your best investment because the return on investment isn't that big. But for us personally, the house we bought here in LA, it was huge. So we were like, if we can do this in another place where it's an up and coming market and make it work for us without putting a lot of work into it. I mean, it's zero work for us. The new build, they have it all set up. They have their preferred lenders who have great rates. We got 15% down on both the properties. So we were able to buy two, which I mean, you have the PMI, but it was with the worth the, the private mortgage, the mortgage insurance, but it was um, worth it for us to be able to get into two. Um, so we did that. Um, and then also just in terms of kind of like upkeep and stuff, we bought them and just are letting them sit back. And the ones we've bought and they've already, they're selling the same models in the complex and they've already increased each $12,000 in value each house. So, yeah. Oh, that's a pretty good deal. That's pretty awesome. And to get 15% down, that was just, you were just, how were you guys able to do that just through the, the, the home builders? Cause that's not very, that's quite rare. I feel like. To yeah. Do. So it was with their lender who they referred, who was Wells Fargo. I mean, it's a big bank. So, and they do a lot of their deals from them. the mortgage broker that I was speaking to. He had personally invested in these, in this company who does the new builds. And then the company that builds them out, they have their own property management co team that comes in and manages the property uh, for out of state investors who are just looking to buy something, turn it over to a different management company and then just collect the checks, which is what we we wanted to do anyway so and because they're already invested in the deal the property management company because they know that they're going to be the ones running it on a day-to-day -day, we felt that they were going to make sure to do a good job and making sure it was built out properly and that everything was up and running so they had more they had more invested in the deal that's cool so the, these properties were built as rentals they weren't yes. built in. yeah um, built, build to rent program is kind of it's what it's called yeah yeah i've heard of that that's that's really cool because then I'm guessing when they build it, the finishes on the inside are designed with renters in mind, right? They're not yeah. designed with homeowners with- Exactly. With They're looking for stuff that's gonna make, uh, handle wear and tear a lot better, I'm guessing. Yes, yep. So did you guys have any input with that or was it just a case of, how, talk us through the process, I guess, from start to finish, how, that, how you found them, you know, did you, was there any negotiator on the deal? How did you analyze the deal? All that good stuff. Yeah. So these actually ironically came to us when we were still exploring the Burr method over there and vetting out property management companies. I called a bunch of them, probably five to 10 different property management companies, just to kind of feel out what the standard rates were and coverage and that sort of thing. And th this company was one of the ones I called. And when they called me back and someone reached out to me, they were like, oh yeah, we manage properties, but we also do this. We also have these build to rent homes. We could do this. They started showing me the numbers and the deals. And it was kind of like, oh, this is cool. Like, this is what we own personally. It felt right for us. Um, so we hopped in on that. And then with that, they um, were like, okay, here's a couple of different lenders we use. And they even gave us like three or four. And then I vetted those ones out. Um, and the whole process is just very smooth. Um, they they kind of handle, they make it easy for the investors. It's a really easy investment, which is total 180 from the Burr method of what we were <laughs> originally going to go in for. But it really lined up and we were able to get into these and then like switch over into multifamily quickly because it was like, okay, these are taken care of. Like we don't really have to do anything with them. They're kind of just sitting on their own. We're collecting cash flow on them. They're just their own little investment. That's so cool. What um what roughly do you make in cash flow from those if you don't mind me asking? So it's a it's a, a couple hundred a but a month. Um so I think like two to three hundred, which is it's fine. It's good. I mean, we're fine with that with the mortgage insurance and everything. Um with the 15% down, it it was a good investment for us. Yeah, I think that's great. If you can make two or three hundred on the new bill, right? Because it really that that's pretty much pure cash flow, right? Because usually yes. when the difference between your mortgage and your rent isn't usually what you make in cash flow, right? Because right. If you're buying a property that's 20, 30 years old, there's going to be 
the right. flood rates and there's going to be issues but on something like this and do, do they what do, what kind of warranty do you guys get on something like that so um you, uh, different things are warranted different like the appliances inside are warranted i think for like two to three years the roof is a long time i don't i don't know offhand because they're all kind of different mm -hmm. um but there are a lot of warranties on it and then so even we've had like a maintenance request go through um with something and it gets handled immediately right away they actually had renters sign a year lease before it was even finished being built they already had runners ready to go yeah wow. crazy so this is pretty much like a turnkey turnkey um, yes. business in a way so that you don't have to do anything you just buy it they, they put the, the rent in they have the property managers lined up or did you do you what do you get to choose the lenders the, the property yeah managers? the lenders you get to choose that i think i could have some input on the renter selection but we just wanted to be so hands-off we created a, a great relationship with the kind of the sales rep who was getting us onboarded on the deal and our communication with her has been so awesome that we felt well taken care of we felt that we didn't really need to be involved in all the nitty-gritty parts mm -hmm. of all the details i mean we could have been i think if we wanted to but we really just trusted that they knew what they were doing and kind of just give them free reign to do it and they keep us updated through the portal that we have so we can be in, in, as involved as we want to um yeah that's cool though it's because it's kind of again it's designing that investment that suits what you guys are looking for right you know yeah. other side of the country busy busy professionals you guys don't want to be bogged down by the details. And like you said as well, if you're too involved in a property, it doesn't give you time to go do other stuff, right? If you exactly. like now you, you guys went on and did a syndication from there. Like yeah. if you guys had bought a burr, there's probably a good chance that and maybe you did try the two of them, you probably wouldn't have had time to do something else, right? Yeah, yes. It would have been uh I don't know. I I, I just <laughs> felt like it wasn't gonna be a good decision, which I mean in hindsight with the multifamily deals we're buying now, their value their strong value add. So we are doing larger renovations on them, but um it's it's a way higher scale that it just makes more sense like the the reward is way bigger than the risk that we're taking in these type deals yeah well with with like you said with bigger deals it becomes bigger profits and also so then you don't mind spending that time on it right but right. A, you know, a smaller deal where yes you can get your money back and the, all the birth uh, uh, benefits that you get with that but you know on a bigger deal you, you're growing your profits so it, it makes sense to spend time on that right because your return is bigger right and your, your right. time your return on your time is also bigger as well so it, it makes complete and also what i like about bigger deals as well is it lends itself to teams and let, and having outsourcing a lot more stuff, right? You know, you can outsource a lot more stuff with with bigger deals. So I, I love that as well. So cool. When did you buy those um, two? Uh, has it been a while yet, or is it quite? Um, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of 2020. So okay. yeah. And they yeah, held they, up well during uh, COVID. They have. They have been very resilient to it. We've had really good luck on them. They're just kind of hanging out and we're collecting cash flow and they're hopefully appreciating. So that sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, they were easy. That's awesome. That's really cool. That's really cool. Why why did you guys pick uh, Atlanta, Georgia, just out of interest? You said earlier there was a few reasons why you picked it. Yeah, um, we just had heard about it a lot. Um, when you get started in investing, I mean, especially right now, it was like Texas, Arizona, the Carolinas, Georgia. Mm -hmm. We had friends over in Georgia who could kind of, we could bounce ideas off of and say, is this really how it's been? Is that what's going on over there? Um, they, they have so many improvements to the state, uh, one of the largest international airports. Um, primarily the film industry is really taken off there. They're building tons of studios there. I mean, almost anything you watch that gets put out right now is being filmed in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And just because we're here in LA, we see it everywhere, how the film industry is like really, I mean, it's, it's influenced the LA market to every degree. So we felt really safe with that going over there. If that was one of the largest industries, there's a lot of other industries over there as well. I know Amazon's over there. Walmart's huge. Um, a couple other headquarters, I think Chick-fil-A is headquarters there. So it's big. It has a lot of other industries going over there, but those were kind of some of the reasons and way lower price to entry. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, California can be tough, I think, especially. Yeah. Los Angeles is a tough market, I think, to start investing in. 
Um, so then you said you you know you kind of went there. You did those first two two ones that everything went well, and I'm sure with a lot of people, your first investments, if it goes well, it's that proof of concept, right? Yes. Wait a minute, I didn't die. <laughs> the houses didn't burn down. Um, everything's okay. You know, right. you know, even if you don't necessarily make a huge amount of profit, and I think two or three hundred dollars a door is, is great profit actually. But even if you didn't, it's that okay, I can do this type of thing, right? Yeah. And I had that moment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then you decided from there to go completely a different route in some ways. Okay, it's still rental pro properties, but to go into multifamily and to syndications. What kind yeah. of what what kind of led you to that? And I, th I think it's an awesome decision. I was just wondering, you know, not everyone makes that decision. So yeah, um, just listening to more podcasts, kind of hearing what people were doing. Uh, we definitely wanted to scale. Um, when my husband and I first started investing in real estate, we really wanted to get specific on the why of why we were doing it. And we just had had our two young girls. Um, we work busy full-time jobs. We just wanted to be in a position like five, 10 years from now where we would have a lot more freedom with our time. Um, and be able to kind of be there for every event for our daughters. That was really important to us. So we were like, okay, we need to scale faster. So um, listening to people and how they scaled, a lot of them started scaling through multifamily. It just allows you in syndication model, you're pooling together a lot of resources, um, different capital from different investors, and then making even larger returns. Um, so after looking into that a little bit more, educating ourselves on it, we were like, oh yeah, this is what we want to be doing. And and even with healthcare and what I do as a nurse um, in my in my leadership position is like I'm very involved in operations and process improvement and kind of making all the pieces work together as a whole. And I felt like that's exactly what a syndication is. I mean, you're doing a large a large deal. There's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of networking. Um, there's raising the capital, um, overseeing the renovations. Uh, it just, it felt more aligned with, with our personalities and kind of what we wanted to get out of real estate. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's surprising actually is how many people I speak to in the corporate world that say their skills that they learn in the corporate world fit well with multifamily. And it makes sense because essentially, even though it's an investment, it's a business, right? Yes. It's a yeah. business. That's what multi, even though it's real estate, it's a business more than anything. Right. You're buying a cash flowing business. And I think, you know, the, a lot of those skills are transferable that you, you, you have in the corporate world. Um, yeah. So what was your, what was your first venture into it? What was your first deal? Your first um, deal? The beginning of this, of the summer. So just did it. Yeah. Got the first one under um, already looking at our second one, but the first one we just um, closed on a few, got it officially about four weeks ago now. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Still, still pretty fresh then. Yes. Uh -huh. what, what was that? What was the, the size? How many units was that? So that one's a 12 unit up in Oregon. Um, we were looking still in Georgia for this, but looking open to other markets as well. We have family up in Oregon. So we were just talking to brokers up there, creating relationships, just looking at deals more out of curiosity than anything. And um, we got a really, really great value add deal um, across our desk by a great broker that we were talking up over there. Uh, 12 unit, a strong value add, um, rents were 18% below market. There was an opportunity to turn a storage unit into a extra studio unit. So it just skyrockets the NOI. Um, and we could make that the numbers work for our investors within a three year time period. So it was a great deal. Oh, cool. Do you mind me asking what you guys paid for that? Yeah, one million. Okay. Uh, yes. So, so that's a little, little under a hundred k a door. What is um, yeah. what um, in that? What is that market like? I guess Oregon market. Is it is it a tough market? Is it a strong market? So I, we were kind of skeptical about Oregon just because you never hear about it on any podcast or anyone, no one's investing in Oregon, it seems like, except people that live there. And so after investigating kind of more why that was, it was just, it's a very liberal, liberal state, not very um, landlord friendly laws. Uh, there is rent control in the market, but it's about, it's just under 9% um, a year. So it still was in line with our um, business strategy of what we were going to do with the building anyway. So we didn't see that as a huge roadblock of why we shouldn't enter into the market. Um, very strong rental market, especially uh, the town we invested in. So a lot of a lot of good opportunities up there. And it seems like the more I was talking to who was investing in there, it's like people that live there are investing there. That's cool. Yeah. They, um, you, you said something there about building, you, you built good strong broker relationships yeah how, 
how did you guys do that? Obviously, being new for anyone kind of understands when you when you're new and you don't have that experience, even though you've got two rental properties, it's hard to get brokers to take you seriously, right? Especially to get them to send you good deals because they want people with a track record, they want people that they know are gonna close. Right. Uh, how, how do you guys build that relationship? So persistence, um, just kind of and being really transparent. So yeah, we hadn't done any multifamily deals, but we had support. We had a coach and mentor that was working with us. So we kind of relied on his um, like um, experience and what he's done. Um, we had him kind of behind us overseeing a lot of what we were doing and just what we were looking for, uh, what we were going to be able to close on money. We had raised already from investors. So the more we were honest with what we were doing and then kind of all the properties we were looking at, um, letting them know we were crunching numbers, Every time we would get a deal sent to us, we would give them feedback. Even if we weren't interested in it, we would just at least give them feedback as to why it wasn't going to work for us. Um, so really just keeping like constant communication with them. Mm. And I think that's important. Like you said, is once when someone sends a deal is not ignoring them and not like, even if the deal doesn't work, right. You just get back to them and say, Hey, this, this deal doesn't work. How, how do you say that? Cause it's going to be, I found that myself. It's a fine line, right? Yes, you want to yeah. tell them that you don't interested. You don't want to say, "Hey, this deal is garbage." I right. hate it because it's, it's it's crap. You want to say, "Hey, uh, yeah." I usually how I do it, and I'll be interested to see how you do it. I usually start with a compliment. Uh -huh. and, hey, this property is great. I like this, this, and that. I think for someone it can be an amazing opportunity, but for me, because of these numbers and this, this, it doesn't quite work out exactly yep right. start off with like what we liked about it like oh we love like this part of the property this looks great but on like even a quick liner like unfortunately we're not going to be able to make these numbers work for our investors um let me see what else you got that yeah. you're looking at that's like yeah that's perfect okay good and I, I, I at least i know i'm doing something right then <laughs> <laughs> we're on the same page with that <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome so the um a 12 unit what kind of work did it need you, you said it was you know as a value add deal what kind of work did you guys need to do do you need to do it so no major capex um expect nothing major like that uh the man who had owned it before he had owned it for a long time was kind of just letting it let letting certain things go with it it didn't have the major um like renovations within the unit so we were just doing some minor like paint countertops on a couple units um renovating that storage unit into a whole unit so we did have a contractor and an engineer come out just to quote us on that and make sure that everything was on track with our underwriting and that our projections were right given into like such a large um project um but even that was about i think thirty thousand dollars to renovate that whole storage space and then um just having the inspector come and check it out. But otherwise it didn't really need any any major things. Okay, that, that's nice as well, right? That gives you, there's less risk involved, right? If you don't need new roofs, if you don't need any structural right. work and there's no deferred maintenance, it's just, it, it was it mainly interior renovation? Did you need to do interior renovations or not? Or was that pretty good? Mild, mild. They had a handyman on site who was kind of doing some knickknack work on his own, like some kind of shift, shifty jobs uh like flooring like so none of it was really matching within it it wasn't the same if you went into every unit each unit had kind of a different thing going on in it so um just certain things like that it just wasn't the best job being done so we decided like as turnover would happen we would just go in and they're smaller units just do some minor uh rehab in them okay do you have any idea kind of what, what you guys would be spending per unit or is it depend is very it? minimal okay. um we did like a thousand a unit because not all of them really even needed it and that was really um conservative yeah that's really minimal that's great that's yeah <laughs> that's what you minimal. want right especially if you can you know bump rents 18 percent right that's that's pretty nice so yeah. you you guys decided to go syndication route on this one right and so one million purchase a 12 unit right usually these small deals you don't always hear about people doing syndications any reason why you guys did that rather than maybe a joint venture or some kind of partnership? Um, mainly because we had friends and family who are interested in doing it with us. And because we knew down the road, we wanted to get into syndications anyway. So um, we did think about joint venture partnership type thing, but we weren't really as involved in networking with other big investors who were doing the same thing. We were more talking to investors who wanted to be passive in it. Um, friends and family who knew we were doing real estate and kind of wanted to just jump on board with what we were doing. So um, we syndicated out and raised about 200,000 and then invested ourselves. 
Oh, nice. So what was the total raise that you guys needed to? Uh, 350, um, just to have a really big cushion on anything that went wrong. I mean, we had to put in some extra reserves because of everything with COVID. Um, but otherwise, we just really wanted to make sure that we had a lot of cushion. Smart. Yeah, that's having reserves, I think, right, is one of the biggest um, ways that you can protect yourself, right? If you have that reserve, yes. and especially if the property is cash flowing and you have um, good debt on the property, it can make a big difference. How, right. um, so it, was it just basically friends and family that you'd spoken to before that you, you got to, to, to invest with, with you guys or did you get any outside investors outside of you? No, no outside investors on this one. Um, these were all just friends and family. And how did you, how did you guys set up the, the equity split? So um, 20, 80 GP, 20%, the investors have 80%. Um, and then we had a guarantor on the loan who was also an investor. So we gave him a small portion of the GP and then we invested in the deal. So coming out of it, just the way everything worked, we own over 50% of the building because we invested as well. Nice. Which was a term for our lender, which we didn't find out until like the last week before close. They're like, oh, by the way, you guys, the GPs need to own over 50% of the building. So if we hadn't, we had an investor drop out last minute. So we had to put up more capital, which we weren't initially thinking that we were going to have to do that. So we were a little bit frustrated, like, oh, we have to put more capital. But then when our lender came back and said, you guys need to own over 50%. We were like, oh, well, it worked out with the numbers because we're putting up that extra capital and it it ended up paying out. Is, is that standard? I don't know if I've heard that before. Is that, or is that maybe because you, you guys were newer syndicators? I think maybe because it was it was a local credit union, union who was doing it. And honestly, our mentor hadn't really, he's like, oh, I've heard of that. I wasn't really expecting them to do that. But um, yeah, we weren't expecting it either. Mm. But it works out, right? I'm sure you guys yeah. get to it. And you guys get to enjoy more of the returns as well, right? Yes, you? it was an awesome deal. So even after we closed on it and we were rerunning the numbers, we're like, okay, this is kind of great. We were forced to put more into the deal. <laughs> it worked out. Thank goodness, yeah, yeah. What, um, what kind of loan terms did you guys get? And did you have trouble getting financing? Um, so 25% down, I think 3.8% interest rate, 30 years. Uh, there's a prepayment penalty, but we're going to hopefully work with the lender down the road when it comes time to exit after three years. Our extra strategy was built in after three years, so there would be a prepayment, but we put that into our underwriting, so it was considered even then, but we're hoping we can kind of work with the credit union to get out of that they said they might be able to so we got pretty pretty good terms for our first one okay and it was it a five-year term what kind of term did you get on it what was the balloon uh 30 year also it's a 30 year arm and a 30 year balloon um the note isn't due for five years or you know? yes five yes okay okay oh yeah. that's what you give because you get business plan is three years so it gives right. you a years from that yeah that's a yeah. great one I mean, 3.8 <laughs> that's awesome yeah it's, I know, that's good. That's really cool, yeah. Do you guys have any trouble, you know, obviously being um, first-time multifamily syndicators? Did you guys, have, I know you had your, your coach behind you, but was it hard finding finances or was were people keen to lend to you guys? Um, so the broker, he, we had such a great relationship with them. He had their preferred lenders that they worked with and um, the bookkeeping wasn't super great on this property either. So um, they were working with a lender who they knew would be able to take that in consideration with everything. Um, and basically because it was their recommendation, we, they worked with us to make it happen. We had to bring on the extra guarantor on the loan just to meet the net worth liquidity requirements of the loan, but otherwise, um, it was pretty straightforward. Yeah. That's, uh, that's another great thing about multifamily is you can use other people's net worth and liquidity, right? Like. So for, for people who don't know, when, you, when you're qualifying for a loan, you usually need a net worth or liquidity equal or greater to the loan amount, which was, uh, you said, 750000 right? It was 25% yep. down, 750000 So you can bring someone in and get them to sign on the loan and give them either a percentage of a deal or, or some straight up cash or whatever works best for you and that person. So I think that's really cool as well that maybe people don't always understand is that you can use other people, right? You don't have to do, again, you don't have to do it all yourself. It's the old adage that it's a team sport, right? Multifamily investing is a team sport. So that's, that's cool yeah. to be able to do that. 
Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, luckily we had an investor who was willing to do that and was happy to, to get an extra percentage of the GP. But especially now, since I've started networking with other investors and doing meetup groups and that sort of thing, there are so many people out there that are willing, like if they believe in you as an operator and think you're doing good work, that they will sign on with you just as a KP on the deal, a key principal as on the loan, just so you can meet those requirements. And there's so many people out there that are willing to do that for you. It was pretty crazy to know that existed, that people were willing to hop on a loan if, if they thought you had a good track record and it was a good deal and that sort of thing. But there's a lot of opportunities to network with people and make it happen. Yeah, I, I, someone told me that a while back and I thought it was so true, right? Everyone's focused on money and deals, but that key principle, right? That sponsor that's gonna sign on the loan is huge. Yes. Because you can't do anything unless, unless, unless you're super rich and super wealthy, right? And most people who are probably not, doing the deals that we, we're looking to do right and it's um so if you have someone like that and you line up those people those are just as important as the as the limited partners and the deals themselves right yeah exactly yeah that's that's really cool um you said something there and i i started talking and i completely forgot what you were saying um so oh yeah networking you said that you were networking a lot right now how have you been networking yeah. right recently so I, I'm in a couple of different mentorship groups. Yeah. So this is not something we were initially doing at the beginning. And honestly, now that we're doing it now, it's opened so many doors for us. Like you mentioned the joint venture for that first deal. Like we didn't even think that was possible. Like we didn't know that other people were willing to collab with you and go in on a deal together. And now it makes sense looking at these huge deals that people are doing that you have to create some sort of partnership with people and strategic way of breaking up the deal because it's, I mean, unless you have just indispensable amounts of funds to do these deals, um, it's a lot of people bringing whatever they have to the table um, to make the bigger deals work. So, so we started networking in different, um, there's meetups everywhere. If you go on bigger pockets, you'll see tons of people doing different meetups, meetup.com, there's local ones. Right now with COVID, everyone that we're doing is virtual. Um, but they have weekly ones where other people, um, I mean, they have breakout sessions within the Zoom calls, which are so awesome because you can kind of have more personal time with people to really see what everyone's doing. And for some reason, before I started hopping on these calls, I thought like everyone would be doing what I'm doing. Like everyone's in here trying to find multifamily deals. They want to be an operator. They're trying to syndicate race capital. Like I was just assuming that that's what everyone was doing. And I'll hop on a call now with 50 people and only a very small chunk of people are doing that. There's people who are out there saying, I just like capital raising for my deals. I have strong networks. And then um, they create partnerships like that. There's people, like I said, who are just willing to hop on as a KP in the deal to sign on on the loan. There's people on these networking events that are just wanting to be LPs or um, like passive investors in the deal, limited partners, just kind of sit back and invest in the syndication and they just kind of want to see how some of the operators are working and meet you and see what you're kind of doing. So there's so many different people out on these meetups that are all doing different things. And it's so awesome. Like the majority of them at the beginning of the meetup, they'll say, okay, like we go around and say what we're doing, kind of what we're looking for, and then drop um, some stuff in the comment in the chat section, just so you can kind of collab and reach out to people. And I've been scheduling weekly calls, just kind of trying to network and build relationships with people. And it's been huge it's been so cool to see even people investing in the same market as you and kind of just throwing ideas off each other and seeing if you could create something in the future together it's been really awesome that's yeah that's really cool yeah, these uh, that's one of being a huge plus for me as well as this meetup event right there's a meetup event in like you say say atlanta right i can't fly to atlanta from los right. angeles but now because it's virtual i just yeah. hop on zoom with my computer and I'm uh -huh. people and like, like we're talking today. Okay. We've never met, but it's pretty close. It's not the same as me, right. but it's pretty close, right? You get an idea for people's character, you, you know, exactly. paper presence, how they look. It's, it's, it's really, really is amazing. And hopefully I, I'm hoping that they keep, I like the in-person stuff, but hopefully they keep some virtual as well, because like I said, there's been events that I've been going to that I never, ever would have been able to go otherwise and meet people that I never, ever would have been able to meet. So it, I think it's yeah. phenomenal. That. It's really cool. Um, when you go to these things, like, 
you, you mentioned like you drop your email or whatever in a chat, but then there's got to be more to that, right? It doesn't, you just drop your email. I've done that a few times and it's quite rare that people reach out to you, right? You've got to make a little bit more of a connection, right? So talk, you know, when you go to that break, breakout room, do you have a strategy or are you just yourself and whatever happens, happens? So um, me right now, I'm really trying to push and build a brand. Um, so I'll say, Hey, I'm Savannah. I um, just did my first syndication. I'm looking to do more deals. This is specifically the markets I'm looking at. Um, right now, I'm really trying to be a guest on podcasts. So I'm like, does anyone, anyone hosting podcasts? And usually in a meetup, there's always a po podcast host <laughs> trying to get people on his show so um, or her show. And so I just get a lot of good referrals that way. Um, yeah, just like a lot of different things. Like the other day, I was trying to learn more about raising capital legally, like, because there's a lot of different legal things that you need to take into consideration when you're raising capital. And I just put that out there. And so there was a lawyer on there who was like, um, investing in real estate, and they were able to refer me to someone and kind of talk about specifically what I was looking for. And there's just so many people on there doing it. It's crazy. Yeah, no, it is. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I think, just by putting yourself out there, right? Like you said, going to these events, right? Talking to people, um, you know, letting people know what you're doing, right? Letting them know right. people what you're looking for. And it's, you can, it just, you can create so much, um, net, you can build so much of a network pretty quickly with all this stuff. And it's just amazing how people will help you as well. It's, yes. that's what I've noticed. It's so cool how so many people are willing to help each other. I love that. Yeah, it's awesome. So what uh, what's next for you then? Do you, that's the, Currently, that's the, well, I'm guessing if you guys closed four weeks ago, right, you guys probably, have you guys done anything else or, or is that it for now? So still looking, we're still underwriting deals. My husband's overseeing the management side of that whole project now. Um, I'm just kind of looking to collab with other people, create relationships, see kind of what else is going on out there. We're still underwriting deals. We're just, we are looking more and Oregon, but then also Atlanta, uh, New Mexico, some, uh, some other markets as well. Okay. You guys look, look, looking for what kind of size deal? If anyone's listening here now, what kind of, <laughs> what kind of size, what kind of type? You never know, right? So might as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, right now, specifically 50 to 100. That's kind of our sweet spot, 50 to 100 units. Um, the markets that I mentioned, uh, strong value add still. We're looking for something that could work for investors to be exiting within five years, return of capital. Um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, anyone's not listening. Too specific, not too broad. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Of course, yeah, it's kind of hard when you're looking at different markets. Kind of really dive into it. Right. Also, um, anyone's listening? I don't know if we have any podcasters out there. Make sure you yeah. guys reach out to Savannah after this. We'll, she'll have the we'll we'll share the contact details at the end. So anyone's yeah. looking for a great podcast guest, <laughs> Savannah's the one for you. She's the network nerd. Ne <laughs> I got a list there. Yes, yeah. Try and say that a million times over. <laughs> network nurse. Okay, that's awful. Cool. Awesome. Well, fascinating story. I love how you kind of realized early on that the burr wasn't the right fix fit, fit for you and found what was, right? And went with yeah. those. And who knows, right? These properties might turn out to be even better than what you may have may have figured out with on a burr. And you guys were able to also get in with 15% down, which is a huge bonus, right? So it's a, yeah. the, you know, the more the more leverage done right, you can do the further you can go and the quicker, I think, as well. And then buying a 12 unit as a syndication is just really cool, right? So to, to kind of be able to make that work and bring bring on investors and everyone profits and everyone wins. I yeah. Think awesome. And now I'm sure you're going to go on to much bigger and better things for sure. And much bigger deals. So it's exciting. It's going to be exciting to see, see that all develop. Um, but as this show is called wrestling with real estate, I always like to ask wrestling related real estate questions. Um, I'm sure you're very excited about this. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't braced with this until just now, so I'm, I'm thinking right now. <laughs> I like to put people under pressure. Um, the first question is, and the hardest one probably, what would your wrestling name be? If you picked a wrestling name for yourself, what would it be? Oh my gosh, I'm going to just say like the nurse mash or something. It'd be something like that. I really do not watch a lot of wrestling, but it sounds like a good wrestling term. Okay. So I'm going to go with that one. Uh, the nurse mash. I love it. Um, every wrestler has a special move, right? And when they hit that move, the match is over. It's the biggest strength in wrestling. What is your special move in real estate? So what is your biggest strength in real estate? You think? 
I think the closer, like getting it done. I, I think like seeing it through to the end, any sort of project there. I mean, as you know, real estate is not a get rich quick type deal. It's a lot of patience needed to make it through a real estate transaction. There's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of different things to consider, a lot of different holdups, potentially a lot of things that could go wrong. So kind of seeing it through to the end, staying persistent, being the closer. Awesome. Yeah. And I think being a closer is good as well, because when people know you're a closer, right, they're going to bring you deals, right? The last yeah. thing you want is someone who doesn't close. By just being a closer, I think you can get people to bring you deals. So I think that's great. And what's been the biggest body slam you've taken in your real estate investing career? What's been the biggest setback, I think? Um, I think doing the first syndication deal and having to utilize um, extensions in our in the original contract for the closing uh, with financing we weren't really expecting things to take as long as they did but like I said with real estate some things can get hung up uh, banks and lenders are flooded right now because rates are so low and everyone's trying to refinance and finance and get loans out so it took a lot longer than we thought and it we, there was a lot of patience required and we were really like getting emails at 9 p.m. on our last day for the extension on some things, but just being patient and trusting the process and knowing that it was going to get done, staying persistent enough and patient enough is just like a very fine line. So navigating that. Cool, cool. Um, well, so was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope getting ready to jump, but you were too scared? What was it and how did you overcome it? Um, I think going back to the Burr strategy that we were originally going to do, I mean, we were really set on it. We were, we got the Burr book. We were ready. We were looking at what exactly we were going to do. And we were like up there, ready to dive in and ready to submit offers. And it was kind of like, nope, like this isn't what we need to do. And just instead of quitting and giving up on real estate altogether and saying, this isn't for us, we're not going to do it. It was really just pivoting and going a different route and exploring a new a new thing that was more aligned with what we wanted to get out of it cool cool well you got a very interesting story I'm, I'm, it's awesome what you guys are doing and continue to do right and continue to build a better future for yourselves and that create that freedom at some point for you to spend more time with your family i think it's it's awesome what real estate can create for us right we can create whatever life we want through real estate and exactly it's really cool cool well before we go how, how can people reach out to you how people find out more about you and your you, you and your company i guess yeah the best way is to head over to my website thenetworthnurse.com and i'm also the net worth nurse under every social media handle so linkedin facebook instagram and youtube but you can find me under the net worth nurse awesome awesome great branding by the way i love that <laughs> thanks cool well thank you so much donna it's been awesome i appreciate you taking the time and it's been a lot of fun yeah, it's been so much fun. Thanks, Barry.